got blown plaster, we've got existing plaster to go over, we've got roll plugs, we've got corners that have buckled, we've got holes in the ceiling, we've got cracks above the windows, and we've got areas that need some real attention. So it's going to be a big video, we've got a lot to cover, and I've got a lot to do. I've got a tight deadline, so I'm going to show you everything that we're going to go through to make sure this is right. Okay, so first off, we've got to look at the areas that are drumming. Now, this is one particular area around the door frame. What I like to do to test if something's right or wrong is do a knock test. Now, this is an extreme example, but I just want to show you differences so you know if plaster is loose and not fixed to the brick anymore. That is solid. That is drummy. It sounds rattly. It sounds like this space between the plaster and itself. Any areas like that need to come back. Literally do that with my fingers. Can you see? So that, all the way up there, needs to come back. That needs to come back. And now what we're gonna do is search your whole room for areas like this. Flaky bits of plaster, bit of plaster that isn't fixed to the brick. We've gotta get it all back, all off. As painful it might seem. <laughs> so I'll be honest, there's a lot of areas coming back to this room that I'm not allowed for, but as painful as it may seem, you need to get it off and you need to do it properly. Otherwise, you'll just fail. anyone knows anything about wood chip, it's a real pain in the ass to get off. And one, I'm on a bit of a deadline. Two, I did not allow for this. Obviously, I knew the coving was coming off, but I didn't know that was underneath. And I'll be honest, I've been trying to scrape it off for a good hour now. Oh, it's all the way around the room, and it's proving to be a real pain in the ass. So Next, we want to be dealing with any holes in the walls. And what we're going to do is, just before we bond everything out, we want to find the edge of this scrim tape roll. <laughs> Got it. What I'm going to do is just run a strip through. Now, cut it in. Just any areas where you've got any random holes where raw plugs used to be, just cover your back. I like to just fill them with a bit of scrim tape. For the sake of two minutes, it doesn't really matter. Just rather cover everything up and make sure that we've covered all bases. But I'm also finding that there's a bit of movement in the ceiling. Now, this is quite common, especially with old ceilings where clout nails were used. Clout nails, and not great because they do eventually pull down and pull away. So I know that's where an old clout nail is. The head's shown itself. I'm going to reinforce, reinforce that ceiling with a few screws. So if you ever see an area where it looks like it's dropping a little bit, whack a few screws all the way back to the edge. Scrim tape in the edges where the walls meet in the ceiling along the coving line also. I'm just going to reinforce that whole area. It's just going to help future proof this whole ceiling, the whole room, and prevent any callbacks in the future. Okay, so we have a big hole in a big ceiling. Now, what we're going to do is fill it. Now, luckily, the electricians have drilled these out so they could put the spotlights in. So they've left same hole behind. Now, that's very, very nice for them. But I'm going to tell you what to do if a similar thing happens where you haven't got it. Say if there's a hole in the ceiling that's quite big, can't fill it with bonding, here's the best thing to do. Get a hole saw set, cut a nice clean hole with a drill, obviously cut it where the hole is, cut a nice hole in the ceiling, get another piece of plasterboard, cut a hole out of that plasterboard with the same bit and you'll have a perfectly circular hole to cover up the old gaping gash in the ceiling. <laughs> now, here's how you do it properly. I've got a little off cut of wood, we slip it in, put it roughly to the centre, get two screws about 20 mil away from the edge of the hole, pull down on the timber, there's one, pull it again, make sure it's tight, offer it up to your timber, Job done. Easiest way to fill a gaping hole. That works for ceilings, it works for walls, it works for any piece of plasterboard. It's a great way to fill in a hole with ease without cutting bits of squares out. Now it's time to rebuild. We've caused damage, we've prepped walls, now it's time to put it all back together again. So, 
Bonding, perfect all round undercoat. It's great for filling holes, it's great for working back onto masonry and any situation where you've got to fill in a crater, a hole, a crack in the plaster, or even where it's close to brick, bonding is your perfect cure. The only time you won't use bonding is if it's right back to brickwork and you're starting again and you want to float and set a wall. Uh, float and set is basically where you build a wall up from scratch just using plaster, no plasterboard. But bonding's not good for that. But for anything else, bonding is amazing. So we're just gonna literally fill all these holes in, fill everything in. I'm gonna make it look pretty. <laughs> There's a few little dips in the wall there, a few little internals. I'm gonna try and straighten them off. I can feel it when I came to the edge of the room, I could feel it, it craters in. So I'm just trying to fill them in. It's probably where they've walked, worked up to some boxing. Make sure we've got the square edges right. I'm just going to create a nice base for the future, which is just plastering this wall and getting it nice again. Now here is a detail. We've got a stop bead leading to the wall. This fireplace is plastered beforehand. Not very well, I must say. But what we're going to do is, if you have that, where you have a bit of a build out, always use bonding to build it out flat. It's just going to give us an easier job when it comes to skimming. I don't believe we're building out with skim coat. I don't believe we're building out the thickness with plaster because it just makes your life harder. We want an all round flat base to work with. So I'm just gonna flatten that off nicely, build it out with the bonding. Again, we haven't got loads of thickness to get over, but it's enough. It's enough to distract us when you're plastering and potentially stop us from getting a nice finish. So that's a good tip. Any building out, do with the bonding, do it whilst you're prepping the room, do it before you start skimming. Plastering is stressful enough without worrying about stuff like this. So get that flat under the bonding. Now when you are filling along the tops, make sure that you go both horizontally and vertically. Because even here, I can feel that there's some dips in the wall. Now we're never gonna completely get them out unless we float the whole wall. But basically what I'm getting at is the areas we're building out. Try and, try and build out as best as you can now, which again, like I said, makes all the skimming so much easier. So anything we can do to make the life, our life easier during the skimming stages, is just gonna just make our whole experience a bit nicer. Like I said, it's all about preparation. Preparation is always the longest stage for me. It always takes longest, but it needs to be done. I'm obviously working wet and wet air as well, but with practice you can do that. So I'm just filling all the holes, building out the bridges, and to make sure I've got nice flat ceiling walls to deal with afterwards, which is what it's all about. I'll be honest, I've totally underestimated this job in terms of prep. Um, and this is one thing that you have to learn whether you're doing your own room or whether you're doing it for a job. Uh, prep is probably going to eat so much into your time, more than the plastering. Prep is the thing that's going to really take out your budget, it's going to take your time if your plastering is a living. And yeah, I'll be honest, I've totally underestimated this job. Came in, the furniture was in, the lights were low, it looked pretty good, you know, everything looked nice. And then when the room stripped back and all the covings off and the papers removed, you know, it shows a multitude of sins. So, you know, I could lie to you and, and say to you that Every job I do, I make thousands and thousands, but I don't because the, the real fact is that, you know, you don't, you don't make money on every job. Some jobs are good, some are crap, some are medium, and um, you've just kind of got to swallow the fact that sometimes it is what it is. A big lesson to learn, if you've allowed a day to prep, whether it's for business or your own house, double it. <laughs> and that way you'll be closer to the real figure. Because trust me, if you've ripped back a room and you, you won't notice half the sins in there. So always double your prep time, whether you're allowing it for your own place or for work. Good tip. One you have to remember. <laughs> okay, so we've bonded out the walls. It took a lot of bonding, a lot of prep. But I'm gonna get this ceiling pva ready for tomorrow and see how much we can skim. The prep's done. That's the hard bit done in my opinion. Wallpaper's off. Bonding's finished. Now we can PVA ready for the next day. And yeah, despite it being a crappy start, because I've over overcooked how much is there, it's all good. 
I'm getting through it. And unfortunately, this is realities of plastering. This is the realities of working as a plasterer. So that's that. So I'll PVA this back tomorrow. Okay, so the prep's done. It's the next day. Just PVA these walls behind me. PVA that, PVA that. I've skimmed the ceiling. Now, the only reason I'm not showing the ceiling is because I've literally just done a video on YouTube showing you some essential hacks on how to get these ceilings done fast. But not only that, I'll show you why ceilings are probably easier than walls. So click that video there because I don't want to repeat the video or to myself to the viewers who are watching. So if you are intrigued in watching how you can make ceilings easier than anything else you've ever done, then click that video there. Let's crack on. We've got some door liners to work to. We've got in fact, we've got plasterboard leading into existing. Now, what I have done, a quick note, is that bonded out the difference between the two. Again, everything you want to do, plastering-wise, should be done in your preparation. You don't want to be building out thickness with your finished coat or your skim coat of plaster because it's not designed for that. So anything that's raised, anything that needs flattening, do it in your prep. Do it first before you get to do any skimming whatsoever. And I promise your life's just going to be a thousand times easier. So everything's been dubbed out, everything's been flattened. Now we're just ready to skim. But the PVA at this moment in time is tacky. I put it on about an hour ago, it went out, put it on just before I did the seal, after I did the ceiling, went out and got some lunch. Now it's at a nice point where it's tacky. Don't get caught up on this. A lot of beginners and a lot of plasterers think, oh, the PVA is not tacky. It doesn't matter. As long as you've got a PVA on the wall, then that's fine. Ideally, you want it tacky, but it's not important. You know, I often PVA the day before, skim the next day. Don't get beat up about it. It's just one of them things where people love it, but it's not always ideal and doesn't always work that way. The good thing about the PVA being tacky on the wall is that you know suction is controlled. Now, there's no way that if you've got a high suction background, a wall that's pulling in fast, that that PVA would stay wet. So. One good thing you know when PVA is tacky is that that wall's not going to pull the life out of your plaster. If the PVA is wet, if it's still tacky, that means you've got enough room, enough time for the plaster to sit on there without it drying out too fast. So if you're a plasterer well served or a beginner, the most important thing to consider is suction rates, which basically means how much time you have with your plaster. And the more time you have with your plaster, the better the finish. So that's why tacky PVA is good, but it's not essential because you can still have controlled suction without that. It's just a nice indicator to know that actually it's going to hold the plaster back. So I'm going to get this wall on. Nice fit coat because, because we've got bonding, because we've got areas where we've built out, we want nice fit coat of plaster to get over this. And general rule of thumb, when you're plastering onto bonding, hard wall, thicker the plaster, in terms of fitness is so much better. So you want to put it on quite thick, especially the first coat. So that first coat is going to take all the damage and basically allow the bonding to suck it out a little bit without worrying. So the first coat of plaster, nice and thick. Okay, so another crucial element is door liners. Now, we've got a weird situation here where the plasterboard is thicker than the liner itself. So. I can't really demonstrate the best way to do it. What you would usually do is run up the liner. I'll show you on this section, using it as a gap. And then what you do is run the thickness of the plaster to the liner, and then you cut it back. Now, unfortunately, the plasterboard's prouder, so we're gonna have to work alongside it. But the idea stays the same. You wanna stay, run alongside it, and then that way the architrave is going to sit on top. Now, this is one of them real life situations where, where the board meets the wall, there's a slight point. The stud is further than the wall itself. So unfortunately, we're going to have to work around it. So what happens when you have an area that pokes out? You've got to follow it round. Now, troweling through it. Now you want to build the thickness up. You don't want that point to show. But at the same time, if you run up it, you end up with a bare spot. So the other thing is you might have been able to have built that out to the door frame, but since the door frame is shallow, we're at a point where we're kind of stuck. So the idea is get it as flat as possible. 
but sometimes the circumstances means that you've just got to work around it. In that sense, follow the hump around. It's not ideal, but when we come to spatula, we'll probably work around it. And so here we go, I can show you on the top of the liner. Say the liner, I'm gonna run parallel to the liner itself. That way we're gonna get the thickness that works to the timber, and that way the, where the path, and that way the plaster's gonna run in line with the frame, so when they fit the architraves, it's gonna sit nicely on there. Now that is still quite a thin profile, but that's what we're looking for, the plaster to sit just along the uh, length of the timber and run parallel across it. So when you are plastering to it, just run across, run down, and that way you'll have a nice guide on where you want your plaster to sit. That is how you plaster into door liners. Now as soon as that first coat of plaster is on, I'm flattening with a speed skin. Now, there's a reason for that and I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. But we are running cross and now what we want is to get rid of any indiscrepancies between the bonding and the plaster. What we will have where we've bonded out the areas, it's undeniable that you're going to have some dips. Now what we want to do is flatten them but also find out where they are. The good thing about these, using a speed skin, spatula, whatever you want to call it, it'll highlight where your low spots are at because you'll see where it hasn't touched the plaster. You'll have areas where you've got stretch marks across it and areas where it hasn't been touched. The areas where they haven't been touched is where you need to build it out to flatten it. So not only does this flatten, but it highlights the low spots for that very reason, which is why these are so crucial in plastering. Now we're running through, starting on the internal corner. Like I said, it's gonna be a quick flatten here. Quick flatten, it's going to make our life a lot easier, which is what it's all about. If you get the prep wrong, then the stage of plastering is going to be a nightmare, which is why we need to make sure that we're on top of the game. So, I've got this. Now, I don't always do this, but I want to get out of here. I've got somewhere to go, and I've got to be out of here quite fast. Hence the small hit. But, I use the same mix of plaster for both coats. Now this does two things, speeds up the process, saves the mixing, saves the cleaning, but it also eliminates the fact of inconsistent finish. I've been having a lot of comments saying they're getting patchy finish, inconsistent ripples. And what it is, what it ultimately comes down to in my opinion, is the first coat setting too fast. Now you might have the first coat on, you might have flattened it, but sometimes them ripples can still show through on your second coat. And that's because the first coat set a lot faster than the second, you put the second on top, any indiscrepancies in that first coat, it's too late to do anything about it. And then what happens, they dry separate to each other. They don't dry at the same time, which means you're not gonna have that golden color as one uniform color. I'm not saying don't plaster two separate mixes, because I often do that. I mix it up all the time, I did the ceiling like that, but you've gotta know when to put your second coat on top and you don't leave it that long, otherwise that same effects happen. I'm gonna go straight on top of what I've just flattened and get it second coated straight away. That way, the two coats are gonna to set together as one, and you're gonna get this uniform flat finish where there's no ripples peeking through. It's a good system. I know people slag it off, but it's good. <laughs> now it's also good for highlighting the bad spots. Now that bump in the plaster, there's still a bald patch showing here where it's peeking through but we should leave that with a second coat. So speed skim is also good for flattening any areas that have got any dips or bumps. Like I said, there's a bit peeking through, but we should get that with a second coat. So we should lose that ridge on the wall and get a nice flat finish. Again, it's not always possible. Sometimes you have to follow the wall. So now the problem with second coat when you've got a thin liner is you can't put too much thickness on because this is what we're governed by. But still, we want to run into it and trowel up it. Now, even if it means we're just putting a few extra mil on, we're still governed by the liner because you can't have the plaster prouder than the liner because when you put the architraves on, it'll rock out and it'll make it harder to get a nice cut or a nice fit. So we want to run into it, but basically be very careful of the thickness we're working to. So it's a double-edged sword with liners. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not, but you just do your best. That's all you can do. In terms of second coating, it is, I like using the same mix. You can feel it tucking nicely into itself. The second coat sits nicely on the first. And you can't feel 
the separation. Sometimes when that first coat is drying, the dark streaks shine through onto your second coat and you know, it's, it's not always nice, but with this, it's, you can tell it's gonna dry together and cement itself as one. Well. So applying a second coat of the same mix, I always like doing. Now, if you wanna be efficient with your time, we've got a corner and you've got some leftover plaster. Let me show you some up. So your gear, put it on the edge. Only a little bit, little slivers. Just little bits along the edge there. So with the leftover mix, this is some of the best adhesive you can use, some leftover plaster. It's brilliant stuff. It can work, it works nicely into the bead. You know that you can plaster onto it and it's left over from what you've got. So winner, winner, huh? <laughs> and talking about motivation, one of the things that's really changed me at the moment is I'm listening to a lot of audio books, you know, just I work alone a hell of a lot of time. It can be lonely sometimes. <laughs> And even though it's my choice, I do sometimes think, why am I always alone? But I've been listening to David Goggins' uh, Don't Give Up audiobook, Christ. Now, whatever you want to do in life, maybe you're watching these videos because you want to do up your own house, or maybe you've got three kids, you've had enough of the job, and you want to do plastering for the rest of your days. I don't know, but wherever your aims are, just listen to this man's book or just read it. He's a nutter. He's, he's done the seals on two broken legs. He's broken world pull-up challenges. He's done 60 ultra marathons. He's, and all this for him, for him, he came from a broken home where he was never going to amount to anything. The guy's a nutter. So what has totally changed me and my working life is just listening to this guy. Seriously, David Goggins, look him up. He's a beast. So if you work alone and you're doing this in your spare time, give that a go, because I tell you, it's, it's, it's game changing, mate. You might have seen me carrying a midget trowel. Now, you might be wondering, why is he walking around one of them? So, tight spaces are a plaster's nightmare. And unfortunately, there's no shortcut around it other than just using the nice small trowel and breaking it in. So, the one tip I can give is get used to using these small trowels. Get used to them. Use them as often as you can because there's no shortcuts to this. The only way to get used to plastering these small areas is by doing them a lot and getting used to using a smaller trowel compared to your big one. But the one thing I will say, if you do get a small trowel, keep hold of it for life. This is seven years old, they take forever to break in. So small areas are real pain to plaster. Get a good trowel and keep it forever because the more you use it, the more it'll break in, the easier the process is gonna be. So there's no, uh, there's no shortcut to this, I'm afraid, guys. There's no easy way out. Just gotta keep using it. Now, because of the prep, because of the PVA in, because of the speed skimming, and all the conditions after it, this plaster is lovely, easy to work, there's no stress, there's nothing setting, and a basically fast pace, it's nice and flat. And that's because of the prep we did beforehand, and the fact that everything from now on, like I said, the skimming's easy if you just get the prep work ahead of yourself. So now, that's how you master doing rooms in plastering. The secret isn't how you skim the walls, it's how you do the prep work, it's how you get everything after it. So this, from now on, is very straightforward. It's all just skimming, flattening, and it's very easy going. If you're new, or you want to improve the game in plastering, you want to learn a full process to plastering, which we're not going to go into today, unfortunately, click the link below. We do a welcome course of plastering for beginners where we'll teach you the full process to plastering from mixing to application and we'll show you the seven steps to plastering which is ideal for anyone who wants to learn how to get a nice flat wall even if they've never done it before and we'll email you every day with fresh videos until you get to the point where you can start plastering. Thanks so much for watching, I'll see you in the next one, cheers.